Welcome to the home of Doors Redmond Education. I'm Chris Redmond, one of the co-inventors of the Doors Redmond CTG system. My partner, uh, Jeffrey Doors, the other co-inventor, was 20 years older than me and is sadly no longer with us. It is quite a good day for me to talk to you in this way. It is April 2021. It was exactly 50 years ago that I instigated the very first antipartum CTG in the Oxford Maternity Hospital. I wasn't the first person to do it in the UK, but I was the first to do it in Oxford. I done prompted for a very urgent reason. Let me explain. I came to that job as a very young man in 1970 to explore the uses of antihypertensive agents in the management of hypertensive problems of pregnancy, such as preeclampsia. Believe it or not, in those days, there was never any deliberate plan to reduce the blood pressure in these cases. So they all had to be delivered pretty quickly. I therefore quickly learned in the, my first year how to do this, and this bought time for those women who had very early onset preeclampsia. Say, let us say, that would have been delivered before 34 weeks. In those days, neonatal care was not very good, so it was always a better plan to delay delivery for as long as possible. This is what I did. And although I controlled the blood pressure very nicely, the outcomes for the babies were disastrous. In my first two years of looking after that very neglected group in those days of women with early onset disease, every single one of the babies that were delivered died, either before delivery with a stillbirth rate of two thirds or after delivery, the rump who were delivered alive all died during neonatal care. So by this time, 50 years ago, I was desperate, desperate for something better and looked around for what could be done. None of the methods that were available then were of any use at all. However, it so happened that in the previous December, December um, 1970, the very first CTG machine was delivered for use in labor. There was just one. And it was immediately consigned to a special room in the delivery area by the midwives who said they would have nothing to do with it whatsoever. It was research. So whilst my colleagues in the uh, active obstetrics were exploring how to implement monitoring in labor, I asked if I could borrow that machine to see if it worked before labor. I had never seen a CTG before in my life. I had no idea what were the structures of the heart rate at that time. I knew nothing about it at all. The only thing I knew was that I wanted a better deal for the babies. So that's when it started. And it started slowly, it was a learning curve, but it wasn't long before we began to see the occasional traces which were quite different from all the rest, and those babies did badly or died. Well, this was a godsend. This was a revelation. It opened up completely new plans of management that previously did not exist. We could time delivery, which we did, and the outcomes were dramatic. By 1975, five years later, the stillbirth rate in the same group of patients was 5%. Now, you don't need a randomized controlled trial to see that something was working. It was good enough. There was no looking back. There was before, which was hopeless, and after, which was much more hopeful. So, by 1975, antipartum cardiotocography was formalized as a service within the hospital, and a monitoring midwife was appointed, whose job it was to see that they were all done. By 1977, I realized we had achieved as much as we could by looking at the traces and something be had better was needed to sort out the women who weren't quite yet terminal, but were going in that direction so we could plan and manage the situation prospectively. That's when I began to fiddle around with computerized methods. I was a complete amateur and they didn't work. I hooked up with one 
research fellow who said he could do something. And he couldn't do anything. He could talk a lot about the plans, but produce nothing sensible in action. It was a very fruitful situation when I attended a meeting in the neighboring Institute of uh, Nuffield Institute of Medicine, whose director was Professor Jeffrey Dawes. He was a fetal physiology of international reputation. He, amongst others, discovered the occurrence of fetal sleep. And at that time, he was spending all his time recording fetal heart rates from the fetal lamb. So he was an expert on the fetal lamb. I explained my problem. He was doubtful, didn't think it would work, went away and came back three weeks later and had decided that it would work. He was a very strong, decisive man. Once he had decided it would work, he made it work. He had a young research fellow from Groningen who was working with him called Jerry Visser, who's still very active in practice today and still very much concerned with the CTG. We collaborated with him and Jeffrey recruited a young lab technician who had left school at 16, self-educated herself and uh, was very quiet, very hardworking, and very loyal. She became his programmer. She knew nothing about computer programming, but she learned it. So there we were, the only expert was Jeffrey Dawes and the rest of us were amateurs. And at the beginning of the 1980, the dawes Redmond system began to take shape. I was running a high risk level where all the preeclamptic and other patients were, uh, were housed. And we began doing regular CTGs there and we recorded them all. We took them to Mary Molden and to Jeffrey Dawes and they analyzed them. We made progress. He began to organize how to see fetal sleep cycles. And around about 1986, there was a very important discovery. I can remember it well. We were up on level six of our hospital. I was talking to Jeffrey Dawes and I said, do you know, Jeffrey, we're missing something. The traces that really matter have very low baseline variation and we're not measuring that. He absorbed it, he had a very sharp mind, went away and came back with a new metric that he had just invented, which became the short-term variation. The STV, as it's known today, which is still very much sought, of, sought after as the best metric of fetal well-being. So we put that into action and we made other changes and slowly, 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 the system came to a point where we couldn't make it any better. Then Jeffrey said, it's time to market this. He got it marketed by Oxford Medical Instruments at the time. And in 1991, the first Dawes Redmond CTGs uh, were being sold. They weren't known then as Dawes Redmond, as they are now, they were known as System 8000, but that didn't matter. They began to be sold. As it was sold and bought, it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't a dramatic event in the evolution of fetal monitoring. The users at the time were mainly using it for research purposes and the clinicians regarded it, I have to say, with disdain. Their reaction was, what on earth do we need a computer to tell us? Why on earth do we need a computer to tell us to interpret the traces? We know how to do that. And we don't need that sort of help. It's just not necessary. Now that remained to an extent the attitude of the mainstream for the next 15 years or so. It was a niche system which was used by particularly interested people with inquiring minds. But for mainstream clinical management, people did not see the point of it. However, during that time, many, 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 many papers were published on the unreliability of subjective assessment. And the people began to take the message as they grappled with that problem, not only with the antipartum traces, but of course with the intrapartum traces. It is very heartwarming to have seen it develop as an adjunct to mainstream clinical practice. 
Uh, by that time, Professor Dawes was long dead. He died in 1995. And uh, shortly afterwards, Mary Moldham, the architect of the software, retired. So we had to uh, set ourselves new sites with a new team, which we've done, and take it yet further. I won't bore you with the whole story, but the, the very best next development was when NHS England endorsed the computerized system as the mainstream CTG system for antipartum investigation and diagnosis. This then created an appetite for it around the country, which has stimulated many developments in, um, in our team and stimulated the creation of this website. So what will you learn if you explore this website? You will, of course, learn a lot about how the system itself works, what criteria met and what criteria not met mean, what is important and what is less important, what are the strengths of Dawes Redman, what are its weaknesses. However, you will learn much more because once you have a computerized CTG system, the fetal heart rate becomes a much more interesting investigation altogether. There are all sorts of aspects that, of course, in a kind of way you knew, but the Dawes Redman system brings it into focus. Uh, you will learn, for example, that it saves a lot of time. You will, I hope, by now know that it banishes the inconsistencies between observers. It's not designed for any particular antipartum indication. It works in all situations where there may be fetal jeopardy. You will also learn that it's as easy to use as a routine CTG system, but much more reassuring and much more reliable. Its particular strengths are not so much in recognizing the very abnormal terminal traces. You can do that anyway by eye. It's quite, it's good at recognizing the normal traces, which you, of course, can also do by eye, the totally normal traces. However, it can do it more quickly than you. It is surprisingly quick in many instances uh, in its ability to recognize the normal traces. In nearly 50% of the traces that we do in Oxford, it does that reliably and reproducibly within 10 minutes, faster than any of you will ever claim to be able to do it. It is particularly important once you get into the area which is occupied by what are called non-reassuring traces, which are not obviously terminal. You would regret instigating instant action if you just on, did it on those patterns, but they are not normal enough to be reassuring. Dawes, this is Dawes Redmond territory. This is where it functions best and provides a more reliable grading of the degree of the abnormality and exclusion of many of the unusual traces, which would typically be classified as, as non-reassuring, which are in fact totally reassuring. Behind all of this, you will learn that there is a huge database which acts as the evidence base for the whole of the system. It comprises more than 100,000 CTGs, all linked to reliable clinical outcomes. So if there is a pattern of interest, which is a bit different from usual, we can identify those patterns, find them on the whole of the database, and look to see to what extent outcomes are not normal or are as good as any other. So this is the definition of what we call the gray zone, and you'll find that in the website as well. You will find a lot about the episodic patterns of the CTG, which reflect fetal sleep states, and a function that Dawes was very interested in at the beginning in the fetal lamb, and was enchanted to be able to define it in this way in the Dawes Redmond CTG system. You will learn that there is not any important change or any particular feature of the heart rate pattern of the fetus that is not controlled and directed by the fetal brain. You will learn, in other words, that the CTG is a fetal brain function test. 
and that what you are at the end of the day monitoring is not the fetal heart, but the health and function of the fetal brain, which becomes depressed or uh, to a degree dysfunctional with severe hypoxia, the other situations such as infection and so on. It's a very good indicator that the fetus is not well and its unwellness is affecting its brain. So this is what happens when you reach the end of the pregnancy, uh, when you have increasing episodes of fetal movements not help, felt, and at the same time, uh, you have increasing incidence of stillbirth and preeclampsia and other evidences of failure of the placenta. In other words, you will hear about the consequences of placental aging and loss of its normal function, not good enough, in other words, to sustain the baby any longer and requiring delivery. All of this makes a fantastic story. It's been such fun to work with. It makes a very interesting area for you to look into. And on this website, you will find all the things you need to know, things you didn't know you needed to know, but now understand. And you will be able to enjoy the CTG analysis in a way you never thought was possible. In other words, it's a very hopeful website. It's a very exciting topic because it is introducing you to new ways of thinking about the babe, its heart rate, its health, and how you can manage it in the best possible way. So I hope you enjoy your exploration of Dawes Redmond here.